Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference. Thank you for joining us here in the room and on the live stream. The press conference from this annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos is dedicated to the question, are we prepared for the next epidemic? And uh, in order to answer that question, uh, we have assembled a, a wonderful expert panel here. Um, let me quickly introduce them to you. Um, uh, to my immediate left, uh, we're joined uh, by Jeremy Farrar, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust, uh, based uh, in, the, uh, in the United Kingdom. He's also a ma member of our Global Agenda Council on the Demographic Dividend. Um, right in the middle uh, of the panel, we're, we're joined by Sia Khan, who's the Vice President, Initiatives and Strategy at Rockefeller Foundation. And he's also a member of one of our Global uh, Agenda Councils on Social Innovation. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Victor Sao, who's the president of the National Academy of Medicine in the USA. Um, and without further ado, uh, Victor, let's start with you. Last week, you launched the Global Health Risk Framework. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, this framework and how it's related to the question we're trying to answer here. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> so we um, was, was sponsored by uh, the Wellcome Trust, the Rockefeller Foundation, Gates Foundation, and uh, all to seven foundations, plus USAID. And they really asked the National Academy of Medicine to create a framework and recommendations for the future. I think what's unique about this particular report is we consider it's independent and uh, very comprehensive, uh, forward-looking, and of course, timely. Let me say a few words first about the commission, and then I would like to tell you about the report. The commission is made of international group of 17 commissioners with, a, with covering six continents, including Africa continents. And also importantly, it uh, has people with all different expertise, including banking. In fact, the chair of the commission is uh, Peter Sands, who's the former uh, chief executive of the Standard Charter Bank, as well as we have reinsurance in addition to health experts, uh, policy experts, and so on and so forth. So it's very comprehensive. To get the work done, we actually had to hold four separate workshops, 11 days of public hearing, plus it interviewing some 250 experts. So I'd say this is comprehensive and it's not charged, for example, by, say, WHO or one of the agencies. The important issue is that we not, look, not only looked at Ebola, but we looked at other uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics, including SARS, MERS, H1N1, and others. And I would say that the main message of this is that the world is grossly under-investing in the preparedness for uh, infectious uh, disease outbreaks. For example, through an analysis we performed looking back at 10 years of all the pandemics and uh, infectious epidemics, the cost uh, per year lost globally is about $60 billion. That's an astronomical number. And importantly, when you look at that size, uh, you can imagine that this is not only a health issue, but in fact it disrupts life, disrupts the economy, it's a national security issue. Consequently, our report is called, in fact, Neglected Dimension of Global Security. Now, I, th I just want to point this out because this morning we heard from Jim Kim in another meeting when he talked about that pandemics and epidemics can actually cause global GDP loss of somewhere even up to 4%. We heard from Larry Summers last week, it could be as high as 1% to 2%. But whatever it is, I think the message is fairly clear. As Larry Summers says, this is as big as climate change and how come the world is not looking at it very closely. Larry put forth a thing, what he calls severity or seriousness to policy issue. And this ratio is very high because there's not enough policy and there's, of course, the issue is greatly um, very important. So the report actually went through analysis and put forth a number. We know that this is going to be controversial, but with the analysis, it felt that the, the world needs to invest $4.5 billion a year in order to prevent this global security. And it's a fraction if you think about, when we think about military investment in war and in, even in climate change. And, uh, and if you want to look at how to divide this, most of it is in fact in strengthening health systems nationally. But as Jeremy will talk about, we also ask for R&D investment as well as of course emergency 
preparedness and uh, emergency funds. So I just want to quickly tell you about the three main issues on the framework. First is strengthening public health as a foundation of health system and the first line of defense. Because if we look at what's happened is when, you don't, when that breaks down, you have no proper surveillance, et cetera, obviously the effect is going to be de devastating. So we felt that uh, WHO need to be strengthened, be the place where there should be more core capacities that should be therefore develop an external objective, transparent, and accountable assessment mechanism to measure country compliance. In other words, IHR is not sufficient. One should look at whether additional other mechanisms such as the global health security agenda. But also that we should have to hold um, the member countries accountable. And one way to do this is to look at World Bank and other donors' support of these country contingent on the country's participation and the country's performance. We also argue that IMF should assess the country uh, economically in terms of how prepared they are in dealing with pandemics, et cetera. And so that's the number one issue. The second is strengthening global and regional uh, responsiveness in terms and alertness and preparedness. And here we argue that, in fact, there should be a high priority watch list that should be reported every day to national focal points and weekly to the public. And this will therefore get people to be constantly looking at how things are happening. But also importantly, there should be a center, a dedicated center for health emergency preparedness response, which is governed by an independent technical governing board, although chaired by the uh, director general of WHO that we support a contingency fund, and we support the World Bank's pandemic emergency facility. Finally, we talk about accelerating R&D, because at the end of the day, you know, prevention, uh, being able to come up with the vaccines and the drugs to treatment is critically important. And we propose that it should be an independent pandemic product committee uh, made of experts. Um, in fact, it will try to define priorities coordination, mobilize and allocate resources, creating, in fact, guiding principles in terms of harmonization protocols, approval processes, and importantly, we said a billion dollars a year should be committed to R&D, which will come from different sources. So to summarize, the report calls the attention globally that this is not just a health issue, this is a global security issue, and it's really important that considering the amount of global impact it has, that they should be investing in it. And that investment should be going to R&D preparedness, as well as, in fact, strengthening, and most important, strengthen national health systems. Thank you very much, Victor. See, uh, over to you. Victor mentioned the, the, the global GDP loss, and he also mentioned that it's a, not only a health issue, uh, it's, it's also a question of security. Um, what's the business case, actually, for better preparedness for ep epidemics? Sure, thank you, and I think that's a great question. And first, let me just start by saying, uh, on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation, how happy we were to co-convene the Global His uh, Health Risk Framework Commission and also be a lead supporter of this process. The Rockefeller Foundation's been interested in global health for 100 years now, helping build the field of public health, and it's wonderful to work with partners now on this next frontier. Uh, and this next frontier really is about resilient health systems, um, something that's increasingly important in the world that we live in today. Uh, Victor outlined the report perfectly, and to pick up on your question specifically on, on the implications for business, we live in a world now where all these systems are very tightly in 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 interconnected. And so what affects the health system will affect the social system, will affect the economic system and the business system. So for example, we saw in the Ebola outbreak that happened recently in West Africa, how local markets started to shut down and people were just not going to bring fruit to the market because they were starting to feel afraid of being in public and contacting this. That starts to create a food security issue. It starts to create a livelihood uh, issue. And there's all sorts of interesting data of how prices were, uh, were falling and rising uh, accordingly. Uh, it even gets even more indirect to global business. Uh, there were cases where travel insurance companies, because they didn't understand what was going on, were canceling insurance policies for business travelers, international business travelers. So they could not go to these countries to conduct business. So these countries became disconnected from international business flows, much less all the difficulties they were facing internally. And the report has a wonderful statistic about how at its peak, 
SARS, in Hong Kong, airport traffic went down 66% uh, when that was happening. So you can see how all these effects start to cascade quickly. And that is why it's so important for us to think about health systems that are resilient to these sudden shocks. And these sudden shocks are becoming more unpredictable and more acute uh, over time. So, so the report lays out um, you know, the, the recommendations beautifully. We know how broad the implications are and why business should care, why government should care, why the public health community should care. And really right now, what we're uh, hoping for is to see some action. The report was designed for that. It had such a transparent process in terms of how it was making its recommendations so that they wouldn't be interpreted politically. The logic and the rationale are very transparent, mm -hmm. and it gets quite specific about what needs to be done and how much it would cost. And that's all laid out as Victor highlighted. So now we're really looking forward to the business community, in addition to the UN, the G7, and others, to take this up as a call to action because it is directly relevant to them and impacts what they do. Thank you, Sir. Uh, Jeremy, let me ask you, um, I mean, it, it's very clear that the Ebola epidemic, uh, we were not prepared. The, the, the loss of life, the, the economic damage, the societal damage uh, were, were, were massive. Um, what have we learned from that uh, Ebola epidemic that we can now apply uh, to be better prepared for the next one? I think your, your words sum it up well and, and um, that we, we, there are many lessons to be learned from the Ebola ep epidemic and we were not prepared. But, uh, but actually, I think I'd take it back earlier than that. I'd actually take it back about 10 or 12 years to SARS. And if we came, if we come forward, there was SARS, uh, there was bird flu, there was the pandemic of 2009, uh, there's mers cov virus that's circulating in the Middle East amongst camels now. Uh, and coming over into humans, um, the Zika virus in Brazil. Um, there's a number of these epidemics and, and sometimes pandemics, and they're actually not that rare. Um, I could name you a dozen that have happened in the last decade or so. And the truth is today, whilst we're convening, and the, and the report that Victor talks about, which we, um, along with the Rockefeller, we're absolutely delighted to support. And I, I think it's a very important message that the Rockefeller, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, other foundations, including in, in Hong Kong and other parts of the world, supported this. And, and I think that is a coming together of civic society, philanthropy, and business, and uh, governments, because this is a crucial, crucial issue. Um, so we need to look at the sequence of these epidemics going back uh, over the last 10 years and appreciate that whilst the focus might be on, for instance, Ebola, the truth is that it affects the rest of the healthcare system. You can appreciate there will be measles outbreaks in West Africa over the coming years as vaccination uh, levels drop in those countries. And it will have the wider implications uh, for economies of those countries as well. We are not prepared um, in terms of our research and development agenda at the moment. So again, if I go back, SARS, MERS, Zika, Ebola, um, and ask yourself, are we, do we have a vaccine for any of those diseases today that we could deploy? The answer is no. Uh, do we have a specific therapy for any of those diseases? And the answer is no. And that leaves the world very, very vulnerable to those epidemics. And we need to address that. And we need to address that in the inter-epidemic period rather than waiting for the epidemic and then trying to play catch up. So the period of time now, Ebola has come, is coming to an end. It's not over yet, and um, we should remember that. There are going to be more cases of Ebola in the coming weeks and months uh, until the epidemic completely disappears. But these epidemics are inevitable in the future, and we need to conduct that critical research for drugs, for diagnostics, for vaccines, for understanding the anthropology and social sciences behind epidemics, such that when an epidemic comes, we're not scrabbling around trying to respond in a crisis when it's chaotic, but we've thought about it ahead of time. We're ready to go within hours or days, and we can respond and bring epidemics to, to an end quicker. So if we don't put that in place, after all the lessons of the last decade in, the ne in 2016, I don't think we'll ever have another opportunity to galvanize the world, bring industry to it, bring governments to it, bring philanthropy to it, and really set in motion a structure that allows you to prepare for and adequately respond to epidemics. So perhaps stop there. Thank you, Jeremy. Victor, you wanted to add to that? Or? Uh, I think my colleagues are right on this uh, spot on. I mean, that's what we found. If you look at the paper that's on the, on the chair, actually has a diagram, looks at all the last 10 years of outbreaks, and it's really quite amazing. 
and perhaps with getting better detection, or perhaps the transmission is much faster because of travel, you can see the last few years there's a surge of number of uh, outbreaks, pandemics and epidemics. There's, there's no doubt there's been an improvement in surveillance, so you will identify things more regularly. But, but with the changing world, urbanization, travel, uh, changing dynamic of relationships between humans and animals, environmental change, climate change, changing habitats, there's no doubt that these epidemics are going to come truly more frequent exactly. and be able to spread more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In a press conference earlier this week, it was discussed, uh, this was about the SDGs, and it was discussed that basically every global business needs an SDG strategy. How about epidemics? Do you think global business need to develop their own strategies for cases like that? What's your feeling about that? So you want to take it? Sure, I'll, I'll take uh, first pass. So I believe, and this has been a big theme of the conversation here at Davos, about businesses thinking about the range of SDGs and how they should be prepared and what they should do. I think it's imperative for businesses to be prepared for these situations. But they can't take it on just themselves in terms of their own response teams or how they evacuate their own employees. They have to take an interest in this public infrastructure. So of the amount uh, that was outlined in terms of four and a half billion per year, which is really not that much, they need to find a way to invest in that because they'll get a much higher return on their investments if they coordinate it according to this framework, if they work with government and they work with civil society, than if they just build their interior um, response plans that just relate to their organization. Thank you, Sia. Victor? I was just saying that actually uh, WEF, the forum, uh, had a, I think what we call a task force, or maybe a working group, which Jeremy and I both served on, looking at the public-private uh, partnership or collaboration, and came up with the following. One is that the in-country uh, experts or in-country uh, employees, et cetera, can work closely, in fact, with the uh, regional areas in, order in terms of response to stockpiling. But then bringing the greater expertise that they have, particularly in communi telecommunications and others, they can work together in a gl global fashion, which is being discussed as public-private partnership. And I think Jeremy is beginning to think about area of vaccine. In fact, he started discussing that as well. So it's, it's now that is obviously more focused on the biotechnology industry, for pharma. But the broader issue is everybody can play and should be thinking about how to prepare the world. Thank you. <coughs> so we have uh, time for some questions from the floor. We have a microphone here. If I can see a show of hands. Um, yes, the lady in the front, if you could s uh, state your name and organization for the sake of our on online audience, please. Hi, I'm Nathalie Olofos from the Agence France Presse. When you say we need to be ready for the next epidemics when it comes for if, we, if I take the case of Ebola, for instance, 20 years ago, we already knew about the virus, but nobody, nobody, I, guess, I suppose, could predict that the epidemic would uh, come to that scale. How do you, when you say we need to be ready, how do I, how do you identify the viruses or that could potentially turn into large epidemics like the one we saw in Ebola? Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, I, and I think one of the crucial messages is to think forward, not backwards. Um, we, we tend to prepare for the previous event, not the next event. Um, so after bird flu, H5N1, in Southeast Asia in 2004, 2005, the world prepared for a bird flu epidemic coming from Asia. And what did we get? We got a virus that probably originated in pigs coming from Central America. And, and it just reminded me at the time that whatever you prepare for has got to be flexible enough for new events. Ebola also, I think, is a very important message for us to learn when we think forward, and that is Ebola was, was um, first identified in 1975 or 1976 by, by Peter Piot and colleagues. Um, it was a rural disease. It was, on the whole, those epidemics were controlled in rural communities, and the epidemic did not spread. The virus has not changed in the intervening 30 years or so, What's changed is the society in which it operates in. So urbanization, m m movement of people across borders, um, tr uh, international travel has changed the dynamic of these epidemics such that what could be 25, 30 years ago a rurally contained epidemic, once it gets into an urban setting and you've got that infection occurring amongst two or three million people living in very close proximity, all bets are off in terms of the previous thinking about the epidemiology. So the lesson I learned from Ebola 
was don't think backwards that you'll be able to control an epidemic based on 1976 thinking about the epidemiology. The world has changed, society has changed, and that's the driver of those new epidemics, and that's what we should be prepared for for the yeah. future. May I, may I expand on that a little bit? <coughs> um, following what uh, Jeremy said, <coughs> really what we're talking about is um, having the right people together to plan together to finance, to also create platforms which allows you to plug and play so that you can actually end up with a treatment much faster, a vaccine much faster, to have the agreement that prior to the, you know, infection, that is peacetime, that there's an agreement about what's the proper standard of clinical trials, regulatory harmonization, all that is preparedness. That's what you're talking about. And I'll just add one more point. Um, for something to be truly resilient, it has to be prepared for the unknown. So it's not a question of predicting exactly what virus is going to and what pandemic will happen, but a real resilient health system will be prepared for multiple scenarios and it will be adaptive and flexible so people can figure it out and draw upon it as the situations unfold. Thank you. Um, Benjamin, you had a question? Can we get the microphone, please? Yeah, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what kind of in-kind in help uh, the non-healthcare companies should be providing. And also, what feedback response, if anything, you've had in Davos to this idea? Yeah, I'm, I'm personally very keen to see this broader than just the biomedical, biotechnology, um, industrial partners, because, again, there are, there, are, there are new players in this that are, could be critical to how epidemics are prepared for or responded to. So, for instance, data companies, um, mobile phone companies, there are big questions about the ethics of that and, and ensuring that communities appreciate what's being done, but, but you, you can't argue the fact that the data coming from mobile phone uh, transmission and movement of people is it would be incredibly helpful to tracking epidemics, and that will increasingly be important. Logistics firms, one of the major problems of Ebola in West Africa in 2014-15 was actually getting resources into West Africa because, mm -hmm. as you know, many of the airline industry decided to stop flying despite guidance from WHO to suggest that it was okay to keep flying and tribute to the Belgium Airlines for continuing to fly throughout the crisis. But, you know, this is not just about a vaccine or a drug or a diagnostic. This is about understanding that broader space and how industry can play a role in it, both w the ones I've mentioned, but also the industries that are dependent and uh, contributing to those economies. So West Africa, for instance, the mining industry was critical. Um, yes. So I, I think we've got to see it beyond the biomedical. Spot on. And I would just add, not only is there the operational capacity of various industries, including media and logistics, there's also perhaps some uh, innovative finance mechanisms. Yeah. So what we've seen in the climate um, space in terms of how there are catastrophe bonds and other innovative mechanisms to help people build resilience to climate events ahead of time and fund them ahead of time, uh, there could be similar opportunities in this space as well. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, please follow up question. A, qu a full question. Obviously, nobody can predict which is the next uh, epidemic, but which are the viruses for which you think there is not enough research done at the moment? W whatever I end up saying here, somebody will criticize. So just accept that as a starting point. Um, I th I th you n you're right, you can't necessarily predict everything, th but you can predict some things. And, and I think the viruses in particular, of course bacteria, parasites could cause nasty things as well, but, but the, the viruses, particularly those viruses um, which could be spread by mechanisms which allow it to be spread easily, by coughing over somebody, so a respiratory virus, so the MERS-like virus in the Middle East at the moment would be pretty worrying to me. Um, SARS was devastating for Asia and Canada and, and other places. Um, so a respiratory virus would be high on my list of priorities. And the other is um, as the environment changes and ecology changes, those viruses which are spread by mosquitoes. So, you know, we've had dengue, we've now got chikungunya spreading across many parts of the world. We've got Zika virus um, in Brazil at the moment and other parts of South America and the Caribbean. Those are all spread by the same mosquito, Aedes. Uh, that mosquito is beautifully adapted to living in urban uh, dwellings. So, you know, the, the, the vector-borne viruses, I think, are also high on the agenda for the ability to spread globally. 
Well, I know that uh, we try to tackle this in our report, and that there was, there was an agenda to look at, list the top 10, and uh, pe people's reaction was exactly what Jeremy said. We can list the top 10, although they exist in PADA and also WHO. So you can say that's a starting point. Right? Can I just come back to you, though, because, I, I, and I should have said this earlier, um, the number one of the things we know about and, the, and number one underlined has to be influenza. It, it's still influenza and it will be influenza for the, the near future. Influenza is the one virus I think we know could cause that global catastrophe. It's done it in the past. It can change. It can come out of the animal uh, kingdom and into the human population. We, we, uh, we don't have perfect vaccines and we don't have perfect treatments and it can spread around the world very quickly. So for me, whatever else we come up with, influenza has to be high on that list. Thank you very much. Mindful of the time, we're closing the press conference here. Thank you all for watching and for, for being here. And a uh, special thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>